You know, you can't see me, Owen, because I'm, you know, disembodied. Disembodied, but yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm kind of dancing, sort of. Sort of a slow motion dancing. Does it, Weird. Does it, does it involve moving your shoulders back and forth and sort of rotating your fists? More of like, it really does, actually. <laughs> you described it to a T. A popular move. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's common. I, I don't know that I'd go with popular. Good evening to Brian F. Irving. The first to wish us a good Thursday. On this good Thursday. Good Thursday? It's, it's, yeah, it's a good one. Hey, Duke made it. Owen and Troy and everyone. He says, hey. That's it. He just says, hey. He just said, hey, that's it. Always good to see you, Brian. Glad that you're hanging out with us today on this Thursday because there's we got some stuff cooking. We have stuff. Legitimately, yeah, actual real stuff. Made okay. by real, real people. Let me check. Are there things and stuff? Uh, maybe a thing and stuff. A thing and stuff. Okay, that yeah. sounds good. Josie says, good afternoon, team. Troy, Troy, Troy he's a verb. And man. <laughs> I see it. Good to see you, friend. That friend, you know, being yeah, related Duke, to me. Duke says, I'd, I'd say I love you, but that would seem inappropriate in such a public medium. Um, I, I actually am a big fan of trying to normalize the idea that you can say I love you to people. You know what, Duke? We love you, and we're not afraid to share it. And I get the I get the pressure. I mean, I think there's a lot of pressure on people to kind of, you know, keep their emotions all bottled up. Unless you get angry, and then you can just let it fly. But uh, we're gonna turn. The, we're gonna flip the script. Thank you, Cuz. I love you too. Yeah, Duke. We're gonna do it. Derek says things and stuff, but never junk. That is the third stage motto. I think that might become our motto. I like it. Things and stuff, but never junk. Um, you know what I'm doing? Turning off this future pop because sheesh, <laughs> sheesh. That music is just something. I, I just don't care for it, Owen. Speaking of Owen, do 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 do. Howdy, you. Owen Casey Stevens. How are you? Uh, I'm doing all right. I'm okay. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it is. Uh, I love Thursdays. I love Thursdays. I didn't used to. I didn't hate them, but Thursdays were just kind of a boring yeah. day. Not really much going on until is, until you is, came in my life. It is exactly because Thursday does not normally have much going on that it seemed like a good day to put a show on. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so, you know, we are going to be reviewing the um, uh, Fantasy Age basic rule book. Yep. And um, we've been doing that for some time, and boy, people like it. Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's a real benefit sometimes to taking one topic in the basic rule book and just drilling as far down to it as we can. Um, because Fantasy Age is just conceptually designed to give you just enough of a framework that you're playing a game uh, that everyone can agree and understand on, on what the parameters are so that you're not, you know, just running around playing uh, – knights and saracens and yelling i shot you with my longbow did not did too um but <laughs> that that flexibility uh works best if used in certain ways and so being able to say hey here's a concept and here are things you can do with it and here are options uh, i think is a great way to uh, not just talk about fantasy age but a lot of this stuff applies to sort of the adventure game engine in general and we are after That's all right. not not Thursday fantasy age, we're Thursday age. So we have Truth, and you know, you bring up a good point because uh, our friend, uh, I always love it when a doctor's in the house, um, just in case um, uh, something should happen. But um, yeah, modern age surprise, that's happening. It's real. It's the real deal. I'm, I'm trying not to accidentally share it before the surprise, you know, 
is unveiled. So stick around. You'll see it. It's going to be good stuff. Um, let's see. What I want to check some. Let's see. Owen seems a smidge too quiet in comparison to Troy. Well, isn't that the way? Let's give you, yeah. let's pop you up high. Owen seems too quiet is not something I ever hear in the real world. That's, that is, that Troy, is audio too, level streaming only. Troy, you're too loud is a daily, hourly occurrence for me. But, you know, what can it, you it do? Is, it is not unusual for my friends when I'm talking to look at me and go, <laughs> we get excited, Owen. We get excited yeah, well, and just wrapped up and good stuff. Duke, how's that now for the audio? I uh, I, I come from a family where frequently you you end up uh, winning a discussion by making sure that your point is most noteworthy. And mm. one way you can do that is to talk over people both loudly and in a fascinating manner so that they hear what you're saying and are so amazed by it, they shut up themselves. I um, want, can you describe fascinating manner to me? I'm, I'm very curious. I, well, I mean, it, it's frequently a matter of telling a story or gesticulating. People may notice I do this a lot while yes. I'm doing things. Um, a turn of phrase or just putting, so I, I use analogies a lot, right? Um, if if you go and you give a lion, you know, a steak at a zoo or or one that you know out in the wilderness, it's just a steak. And and however much it may like that steak, that's not new and interesting. One of the things that people have learned about trying to do enrichment for especially uh, predators in captivity is that if you hollow out a pumpkin and shove a steak in there, um, they smell the steak and they're excited. But there's also this pumpkin, which they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So I am literally using an analogy to refer to analogy, right? I, th that is my analogy of how the analogy is works when speaking in a fascinating manner. Only here, folks. Only here and only from our very good friend, Owen Casey Stevens. Um, I, I love an analogy wrapped in an analogy. Uh, it's hard to say. Okay, so I've got the Fantasy Age basic rule book ready to kick up. Um, I All I need to know is um, you told me the pages, and you know I promptly forgot? Yeah, so um, the, the actual hazard rules start on page 101, although that's just like less than a column. And the majority of the pages, everything that you really need uh, – is on page 102. So if you've got your basic rule book, uh, which we, we have up there on screen, uh, take a look at pages 101 and most importantly, 102. So um, here's the first thing you need to know about hazards. And, and this is going to seem a little surprising given that hazards are a page and a half at most, not even quite. Um, everything, everything in your Fantasy Age game that is not something making decisions to try and kill you can be a hazard. So let me tell you what I mean. Um, if you are facing uh, an enemy soldier or a demon or a flying dragon or a pack of wolves, um, those are all things that are making decisions. In the case of a, an animal, a very simple decision, but still making decisions uh, in an effort to hinder you, kill you, do you harm, uh, convince you that you are, are doing the wrong thing. If they are interacting with you and trying to impact you at all, those use creature rules, encounter rules, uh, the, the role-playing rules. Anything else that could impact your character, you can run as a hazard. Some hazards are obvious. Uh, if the lock has a trap on it, that trap isn't making any decisions. It, it might well have a sort of mechanical decision tree, right? You, you twist right, it does this. You twist left, it does that. But it is not a thinking, sapient, or sentient thing. So that is a hazard. If you're stuck in a burning building, that's a hazard. Mm. Um, a thunderstorm is a hazard. <laughs> Brian F. Irving says, an animal trying to do you harm. It sounds like Owen is describing my cat. Uh, <laughs> my, my family have always been cat people, and people who, who follow me on social media know that I do a great deal uh, with my my housemate's cat, uh, Alphonse Lord Tubbington of Sausage on Chalk Order, the Big Biter. So I have a good deal of cat experience, and the fact that he's in the order of the Big Biter indicates that I am well familiar with cats trying to do you harm. Um, so weather can be a hazard. Uh, if you're sailing rough seas, that can be a hazard. An earthquake is a hazard. Uh, if there is a curse on a door that might do bad things to you when you crack it open, that's a hazard. Absolutely anything. Uh, that that is not decision making that is going to impact your character is a hazard. Uh, Duke just said lava. Lava is a hazard. Now lava is a pretty extreme hazard, 
And you will note that here uh, on page 102, if we scroll down a little bit, uh, actually, yes. still on, yeah, you're still on page 101. So let's go to 102. All right, it says, how dangerous is the hazard there on the left? Um, and you'll notice that the category of hazards start with things that you're familiar with. Uh, minor, moderate, and major happen to be the same sort of uh, words that we use to describe uh, threats of creatures. So if you would have used a minor creature, you instead do a minor hazard and it does a die six damage. Oops. Um, moderate, major, same thing. Now, we then change to arduous, harrowing, and murderous, but they are still the next three steps up. So when you're looking at encounter building, when you're looking at using the, the best area in the book, uh, those correlate with the three higher tiers of creatures. So the, the words are changed. The words are changed so that it is intuitive, right? Um, we, we want you to know, oh, hey, uh, lava is a murderous hazard. And it, intuitively, you as a GM should know, oh, if these are first or second level characters, uh, I should not put a murderous hazard up against them. I, I maybe just want it to be a major hazard or perhaps a moderate hazard. And you can easily do that by reskinning things, right? It, it quite possibly, instead of uh, a lava flow, you have a flow of superheated mud that is coming out of the, the geyser that is being powered by the lava. Mm. Um, and that, that gives you uh, a excuse to go with a less dangerous option, right? Because lava is lava. Um, lava is lava. That is true. Right. So you, you won't want to have to justify, oh, this is only a minor hazard of lava. I mean, unless you say, right, that the, the room has one thumb-sized drop of lava in the middle, and if you get too hot, you might get a sunburn. That, that <laughs> right, could be right, right. minor lava. But um, but I think there are ways to, to think about these rules uh, in situations that people don't expect. Um, if, for example, you wanted to do an obstacle course, if you're a fan of First Night, uh, or it has come up uh, on The Witcher Season 2, or if you're just a fan of American Gladiators or American Ninja Warrior, right? Or if, you're at Derek, or if you're at Derek Barnett's house in a poorly organized room. I mean, if there are Lego pieces, then yeah, that's, mm. that's, a, that's a hazard. So you could say, okay, here's a hazard, and uh, there are five stages to this, and you could... You, you would tie all of that to a series of uh, focuses. So let's take a look at a moment uh, at what our ability focuses are. That's page 10. Um, every hazard, it, it potentially can be detected and it can potentially be mitigated. So if you're talking about detecting a hazard, you are usually talking about some sort of perception, right? So uh, if we're talking about lava, you might be saying, hey, uh, you can see that, you can smell that, you can hear that. Uh, it's relevant for the track. So page all of ten, things, you say? I'm sorry to interrupt. Page, page ten, right hand column, ability focuses. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. And on in my PDF, it's page nine. So I'm I've got to remember uh, sorry. that. Sorry, you got to go one book back. Page ten, right? Yeah. Um. So you just you would pick something, but for example, if you were saying, okay, this is a uh uh an explosive glyph that has been written into a scroll that people are reading, right? It's magical, but it can still be a hazard. Then you might say, well, okay, uh, that will instead be detected with dexterity check with the focus of calligraphy. Do you notice that the writing is dangerous and explosive? If someone, if you've decided that a lock has a uh, trap on it, then you would obviously detect it with dexterity with the focus traps um you can use anything depending on what it is right if if you decide that this uh dagger in a sheath is spring loaded so that when you pull it out of the sheath little needles shoot out of the handle of the dagger you could tell people okay make either an accuracy light blades check because the better you know daggers the more likely you are to notice that it's got a weird spring and the weight is off uh, or a perception searching, which is basically touching, right, kinetic, um, to see if they notice it. So that's the first step. Now, not everything can you necessarily observe. Uh, if you all are, you know, if you open this cave, uh, you unleash the mummy's curse, 
um, the, the curse may not be something that can be perceived. You could decide it can be perceived. This is entirely up to you as a GM, right? You could say, hey, it's going to be an arcane lore focus for something specific, or it's going to be a culture lore for this particular culture, or it's going to be a historical lore for uh, things that have happened to people that have opened tombs before. But you can also just say it can't be detected. Um, if it can be detected, it's possible it can be bypassed. If it's a trap, again, that's very simple. You say, hey, we'll... We'll just use dexterity focus as traps. Uh, and I'll talk about setting the, uh, the target numbers for the tests here in a minute. Um, but you could also say uh, what we have here is a difficult to climb cliff. There's no perception necessary. You see that it's there and it's hard to climb. And I can successfully bypass it by making a climbing check. Uh, you can then set the dc and if they third that sorry dc that's my d20 coming out the target number <laughs> um and if they make the necessary target number they successfully climb the cliff and then if they fail it they'll take damage based on what you've decided is the lethality of the the trap how dangerous is it and it, that doesn't have to be about height right you can perfectly well say hey here's a hard to climb cliffside which is covered in bushes and vines and uh there's soft eroded earth at the bottom and if you miss a check you're going to take a die six of damage even though it's a 30 foot fall because you're going to be grabbing at branches and slowed down and, and hit the, the soft eroded earth at the end you can take that same 30 foot cliff same height and say okay well this one is going to be murderous because it uh falls onto a group of jagged uh obsidian shards at the bottom so if mm. you fall, regardless of how hard the climb is, the damage is separate. And that's one of the things that I want to get to is the difference between uh, how difficult is it and what category of hazard is it? How dangerous is it? So if you are giving people an option uh, to detect it and to mitigate it or bypass it, those are about your difficulties for a basic test. Uh, we happen to have a handy chart on page 31, Troy. If you'd be mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the basic test difficulty chart. So this tells you that if it is a routine test, the target number is 7, easy, 9, average, 11, and so on. Uh, someone says, uh, I find it Stephen Jones. I find it challenging to use the hazards in the book during a game since so many of the rules bits are in the body of the description. Um yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm going over it, right? It's it's super simple to work this out in advance. It's also pretty darn simple once you have a real feel for how hazards work. Because after you run the game for a while, you will know that, okay, 11 is an average uh, target number, uh, 13 is challenging, is 15 is hard. And you would just be able to say, okay, uh, what you all are doing is swinging out onto a cargo net Climbing 15 feet up, great, that seems routine or easy, not a problem, but the cargo net is right over a pit of spikes. Mm. So you do not have to connect difficulty with danger. You can perfectly well say this is a routine or easy hazard. It is not hard to bypass, but if you fail it, you're going to take a bunch of damage. You can also go the other way, right? I talked about doing uh, a gauntlet or an obstacle course later. If you were trying to do like uh, American Ninja Warrior, you could easily say, hey, this is a formidable series of challenges, or maybe it's a series of hard or challenging challenges. So you can get through one, get through a second, but you're, you have to go through a bunch of them. But you only take a die six of damage if you fail because you're only four feet off the ground. The mouths that hit you are padded. You're falling uh, into jello. Of, yeah. You're falling, well, pool of water, perhaps rather than jello. Uh, but the point is that. Oh, given the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I was thinking because of Ninja Warrior, right? They, they don't use jello. I, I, I have nothing wrong with deciding that there's jello in your fantasy age game. That's. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not an issue for me. Um, but don't mix I, up your Ninja Warrior. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> You're, you're, I mean, you know, here are your spoons and jello, fight it out in the pit of honor. You, you can do that if that's appropriate for your game. Uh, you, you just want to make sure that everyone is on board with the jello spoons and pit of honor in your true. Game. Hey, a quick question for you. So, when it comes to uh, focus and you know, choosing those, or, or is there are those pretty much 
I know that there's a reference that says, you know, you find other focus, you know, in, in other settings and things. Um, yeah. Can you introduce just kind of your own? So you can, uh, and if it's super important to your campaign, uh, that's fine. Like, uh, we specifically have uh, an intelligence focus for arcane lore, which is a bunch of different stuff. And then we've got cartography, cryptography, culture lore. Uh, if you decided in your specific game um, that there's this really important thing uh, that is astrology, right? Astrology is this incredibly important thing, and I, I am declaring it as separate from everything else. And people decide when to get married based on astrology, and you can figure out when the enemy is likely to attack based on astrology. You're tying a bunch of stuff into astrology. You can say, hey, I'm adding astrology as an intelligence focus. But the more focuses you add to a game, the harder it is both to remember what's going on and for the players to have a reasonable chance of collecting a bunch of focuses, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if you add 15 focuses to the game, uh, characters don't get 15 extra focuses. So they've got to be like, well, you know, if you said, hey, there's astrology and astrology and there's uh, palmistry and there's herb reading and, these are, yeah. and, and there's dowsing and these are all incredibly important, uh, you have reduced the number of things that players can interact with. I personally prefer if I am doing something like adding important things in, to say something like, hey, uh, there is astrology, astrology is incredibly important, and astrology is considered to be part of nature lore, or astrology is considered to be part of research. Oh, so I like that. instead of creating a whole new thing, I can say, here's something that maybe normally doesn't come up a lot. So I'm taking this option that already exists in the game that someone might pick up, uh, or their background or a specialization or, or a talent might give it to them. Uh, but I am giving it additional utility. I like and, that. And connecting that to hazards, one of the things you can do when you are looking at the focuses, uh, if someone has picked up a focus and it's not coming up in game much and you wish it would, one of the things you can do is build hazards around it. Right? So if someone took strength and they said, okay, I want strength might. I have the focus of might, uh, and might just doesn't come up very often. You can say, well, uh, I am going to create this trap, which is a wall crushing trap, so that the wall slides in, making the room narrower and narrower and narrower. And tries classic, to crush. classic. Right. Yeah. And then you say, and if someone says, hey, I'm going to try and push the wall so it doesn't crush us, or at least so we have more time, then you say, okay, that is a strength might test that is the test you're making and if you do well enough you can break the thing and and you know you're turns out you're stronger than it is um and if not uh, every time you make it uh you can bias around but maybe the difficulty goes up by one and again the fantasy age rules are designed to be loose and easy to adapt and sometimes people kind of fall down a rabbit hole and don't know what it is they are trying to build or pull together and they're like i, I don't know what the right answer is a lot of these terms are not defined other than the very straightforward English language of them, right? We don't tell you that if you have a might of this value, uh, you can break a trap that is this difficult, the wall of which is this big, that has this many foot pounds of counterweight behind it. Instead, we tell you, hey, there are strength tests. One of the focuses is might, and here are the generic numbers for how hard it is, and then for a hazard, here are the categories for how much damage it does. And you can say, you know, this wall, it turns out, is a minor hazard, because while it will try and close all the way, all it will ever do when it gets to the end is treat you like an elevator, right? So it just keeps bumping you over and over. Dish, <laughs> gotcha, dish, gotcha. Dish. That's it. So, yes, it's a trap, and yes, it can be difficult to stop, but if you fail, it only does so much damage. The flip side of that is you can perfectly well say, okay, this is uh, challenging. This is a target number of 13 or even higher, like 15. Uh, and spikes are coming out of the wall as it slides towards you. So it is more damaging and harder to deal with. And we're not going to go all the way with uh, uh, arduous, but we're going to say it's a major hazard. So if you fail, you take 3d6 of damage. A quick question, Owen. Uh, uh, yeah. So we're, we're talking primarily physical hazards. Are there, is there a space for the mental and the, that yeah. kind of? Ah. Absolutely anything. 
that is not a creature making decisions to try and affect you is a hazard. Nice. So uh, if if uh, if you decide that the apocalypse dragon, the mere vision of which causes people to run in terror, um, is just looking at it with no decision getting made, its aura is horrifying, then you just say, okay, well, that is clearly a hazard. Uh, that sounds like it's willpower listed. And if it's a fear effect, then it's willpower courage. So if you have courage as a focus, you are less likely to be driven back by the Sara. Like and while the, hazards, while the hazards only list damage, again, you can do whatever you want. You can look at effects that are, like in the Arcana, that are the equivalent of that. You can say, hey, uh, instead of 1d6 damage, it's going to move you back 1d6 yards as you flee from it. Mm. That is obviously a minor hazard. Uh, and then if it is a you know, in quotes, murderous hazard, you're fleeing 66 yards, and until you have run that far, you can't come back. So people can be terrified and break and flee. Um, we also have actual morale rules in the game which you can break out, but if you decide that anyone who touches the uh, the crystal of all evil has a chance of, of being killed just by the pure mental evilness of it, then you can say, well, that's a, a hazard, it's a willpower focus, and it's uh, the well, it's a willpower test, and it is a faith focus because it's pure evil. Or, uh, you know, here is the the fairy food that is incredibly poisonous, but also smells really delicious. So if you just get a whiff of it, you want to eat it, and it's hard to resist. Sounds like say, play -Doh. Sure, right? Well, I mean, Play-Doh's non-toxic. So True, but I mean, yeah, I want to eat it right now. I mean, especially if you mold it into little turkey shapes. That's uh, mm, yeah, yeah. But again, you would just say, okay, that is a willpower test. And since you're trying to resist doing something you know is bad for you, the focus is self-discipline. Um, there's nothing that you can't turn into a appropriate ability and focus for a hazard, just depending on what the hazard is. And you as the GM just decide those things. And the fact that we've given you these sort of universal generic numbers uh, on this is how difficult something is and the list of tests and focuses and then the list of damage, that is all there is to the entire hazard system, right? And that's why it, it only takes a page and a half, even though it, it potentially defines half of the things that your players are going to worry about. Um, you, you, can, you can say, hey, you've gotten food poisoning. Uh, that's a hazard. And obviously we're going to be looking at the constitution focuses for how to resist that. It'll do a die six damage. And then maybe you say, okay, it's only going to do a die six damage, but until you succeed, it does a die six damage every day because you have food poisoning and you yeah. feel awful, right? Uh, or you could say uh, you've got food poisoning, so every test is one step more dangerous. You know, you, you've caught the flu. So right. things that would be challenging are now hard. Just getting out of bed now is considered routine instead of automatic, etc. You just take these rules elements and you put them together. And I find it is, especially early on, it's easiest to write these things out in advance, right? You can just take an index card. Um, we go through the process uh, on page 102. And we give you some examples, right? We specifically break out uh, the rushing river, the pit trap, and the burning in. Um, all of which are, you know, a paragraph or more. Um, but we also talk about using them as uh, advanced tests and whether you are uh, taking penetrating damage or whether armor affects the damage at all. Uh, one of the, the, and there's that whole doesn't have any special effects, which we got into a little bit, right? Uh, it might have a penalty to speed or it might drive you back. All you have to do is in your head think if you were trying to explain this to your special effects crew, if you're the director of a movie. Hmm. What would you say? And then translate those words to fantasy age, right? If you're saying, okay, so the inn is on fire, um, but at first it's just catching around the edges and the players have a chance to put it out. And then if they fail to put it out, the whole thing is a raging conflagration. And if you go in at all, you risk certain death. Then you can say, well, okay, uh, every round will say, hey, it's a hazard. And it's starting as a routine hazard. And if you succeed, 
get three successes, you have put it all out. But if you don't get your three successes, if the group of you don't manage that, then it progresses to easy. Then it progresses to hard. And it's going from 1d6 of damage to 2d6 of damage to 3d6 of damage. And the players have plenty of times to, to have their characters run out of there. Um, or you could just, you know, we've got a, a very simple burning in version that just says a successful target number 11 dexterity acrobatics check halves the damage from things collapsing. That's great. That's, yeah, that's, put a cool... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, so uh, in, there's nothing I love more than an unexpected hazard. And so we're talking about like, you know, the burning in, the pit trap, the, the the rushing river, all of that stuff. Classic, classic stuff. What would you, um, you know, what is an unexpected hazard from the mind of Owen? Um, so uh, there are things that have happened to me in the real world that were a shock. Um for example, as a Boy Scout, uh, I went camping once, and a herd of wild horses happened to stampede through the field where I had put my tent. Oh, um, I don't mean so to I wake up. I wake terrifying. up in the middle of the night, seeing through the the shadow of moonlight on my tent walls horses thundering by. It was a night stampede. Yes, no, it was a nighttime stampede. <laughs> I was asleep. I woke up to what I thought was an earthquake, and then horses go thundering by. <laughs> um, and as it happens, I had put my tent up against a tree, uh, and as a result, the horses went around it, and I was fine. But an unexpected stampede, yes, an individual horse trying to hit you, that is a creature making a decision, so you run it as an attack. But if you have a stampede, or if you have a swarm of locusts, or even potentially if you have a mob, right, uh, a, a angry mob is mobbing the streets. You can even say, hold on a sec. <coughs> Pardon me. You can even say, hey, uh, this town looks like a zombie apocalypse. When you are outside, we're not going to be tracking individual zombies attacking you. There are so many zombies that walking around outside is a hazard. And so rather than doing, okay, there are five attacks between here and the next room, you just say, all right, you're going down the street. Everyone has to make a, a appropriate uh, ability test to see if you avoid the hazard of a zombie grabbing you. Brilliant. Uh, what a brilliant sort of at, almost like that kind of area of effect sort of thing. Like you're dealing with this mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, it's got this much damage and you've got to check this often. I love that. That's great. Uh, Duke so says that sounds terrifying. By the way, the 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 nighttime stampede of horses. Um, what you know? What did? How many were there? Were that? I mean, did they just kind of gallop I, off in the distance? Or I don't know. Right? They thundered past, and I stayed in my room. And the the scoutmaster told me, "Yeah, we've been told that we shouldn't put any tents in that field anymore." Um, <laughs> All right. Well, th that'll learn you. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, really? You think?" <laughs> um, so then, well, then they moved me to another tent, which the next day turned out to have two scorpions in it. So it was, it really was the camping trip from heck. Did they, did they ever have any suspicion that maybe it was just your luck? <laughs> <laughs> um, after the third or fourth incident, yes, that that was considered as a possibility because I'm not even a little bit. Am I kidding about how really ridiculously cursed? that particular uh camping trip was it sounds like it it definitely does all right so we are over oh, about five minutes to surprise um thereabouts you know give or take uh what do we want to um tackle for the remainder of our discussion on the uh fantasy age basic I mean, if anyone has questions on how they would like a specific hazard to be put together, uh, I'm I'm happy to do that. Uh, I sure love that, yeah. And, and uh, I will put a bug in your ear, ear, Troy, that one of the things you could do if you started doing stat this was instead of stat this monsters, you could do stat this hazards. Right? Hey, you say, I hey, like it. It's, it's a pit and a pendulum, or they're having to climb a rope and someone set fire to the bottom. Uh, or All the right. classic... You, you have killed the evil villain, and it turns out that this was a villain-stabilized lair, and now everything is falling apart, and you have to escape as, you know, rocks fall, rocks tumble, everyone dies, the walls are falling apart. Those are all okay, things so, that can easily be... 
a quick question then. So if we were to do that, hey, uh, you know, because I do love that. It should be sort of a, a motto of ours that we add to uh, the other motto of the day. But um, that is that anything can be a hazard. Anything can be a hazard. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Um, wiser words and uh, truer thoughts. Uh, I'm not sure I've heard. Okay, so the um, uh, a, qu- a question about that just real quick before we move on is the – would I present to you sort of a, a, just an idea? Do you want an image? Do you want to, oh, here we go. Um, this is a good question. Uh, we'll, we'll get to Jonesy's question first and then uh, we'll work out that yeah. other stuff off camera. So Jonesy does in fact have a great question, which is how would you handle hazards that trigger stunts? <coughs> um, and that's a great question. And there is a very reasonably straight, a very straightforward for me, reasonably straightforward for people that are not the developer of the game answer for that. <laughs> Um, look how many points the stunt is, figure out how much extra damage you can get for that many stunt points, and then treat it as that hazard category. So uh, if it's a stunt that takes the same number of stunt points as adding one die six of damage, then having that stunt be triggered is the equivalent of a minor hazard. Uh, If you want it to do both, then you say, okay, uh, I want it to both do a die six of damage, and have a one day six, uh, a one day six stunt that you say, okay, this is a moderate hazard. It does a day six of damage, and one day six worth of stunt points of other effects. Uh, uh, I've got a. Ask, oh yeah, I was yeah. just gonna say I've got a great. Derek asks a really great question. Is that concept? It feels like it really fits. But yeah, break this down. A social hazard would that work for avoiding giving yourself away in an intrigue or something? Is that you, you can totally adapt these rules to social situations? And uh, if you do that, take a look at the social stunts, the role playing stunts in here, and try to build those in as well. Because now you're setting up a situation where people will be making tests. They will be making target number tests, ability tests. Uh, in the social situation, so they may get stunt points. And that is a great simple way to say, and, and you don't even have to make the hazard necessarily about revealing yourself, right? Like you could say, hey, you're at a dinner party, uh, you are there representing your king, and there are two factions that hate each other, and the hazard is that if you suck up to one too much, the others may declare war on your country, or uh... like, you know, like whatever it is. Um, so here the social hazard is you have to play it cool, um, you know, we, we can go to Star Wars, fly casually, right? That's a kind of hazard. That's a pilot. Sure, hazard. sure. We, we need you to keep your distance without looking like you're keeping your distance. Okay, that is a situation. There is no decision that situation is making against you. You have made a decision to do this difficult thing. Um, players can create their own hazards all the time, right? It's a raging river. I don't want to deal with the raging river. Uh, we tie a rope to a crossbow. We shoot it across. We make sure it's good and anchored. Then we walk the tightrope. Great! All you've done is create a new hazard, and if you oh, fail yeah, that yeah. hazard, the consequence is you fall in the raging wizard, and you have to <laughs> get your hazard. Right, right. Hey, a quick question: um, uh, Does the when it comes to these social hazards and things, does the introduction of the envoy uh, kind of create more of that uh, intrigue or opportunity, or, or or what? And I'm talking about the you know, yeah, the the, the core rulebook, which should be coming out later this year. Uh, it absolutely can. Um, in ways that I will talk about more, you know, when uh, we're closer to the, yeah, when when we're closer to that moment. Right. Gotcha. That's great. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, All right. So we've got uh, the great questions, phenomenal questions. Uh, And uh, I am going to, you know, I'm going to ask you, so Owen, alongside the, um, you know, a lot of the things that we're talking about here, you know, it's, it's how, how much can you take what we're talking about here and apply it to other age games? Um, So the, the, I mean, they all have their own uh, hazard entry, but the core idea that I'm trying to present that you can use the rules uh, as a way to indicate, here's a problem. Here are the things on your character sheet you can use and here are the consequences. Um, Those are all the same, right? Those, those are, for any age game, you can you can use that process. You might end up having a slightly different focus. You might have a, a different damage scale, right? If if you're doing the grittiest uh, modern age version, then the the damage is potentially way more uh, dangerous at six dice because people's hit points don't go up. Um, but that process of okay, here's what I want to have happen. 
here are the the target numbers and the consequences here are the abilities and the focuses that process is the same for every edge game all right well so i am here to announce that i've a sense of hazard <laughs> it's a hazard it is what malcolm you're so sh tiny let's not, let's fix that hey how's it going I, i've <laughs> met malcolm he's not that tiny He's he is also not a hazard it's so much as a delight uh, and a heck of a human being. Um, you know, people have been very excited about um, what we've got to talk about today. Um, a you know some some manner of of a of a surprise, and uh, and you're here to kind of tell us all about it. Yeah. Um. Well, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So. We have been super busy uh, with some modern age and modern age adjacent stuff. Uh, I would be, although this isn't the reason I'm on today, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the upcoming Cthulhu Awakens Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. Um, that will be uh, starting next week. Um, so, uh, you know, you should, uh, you should go check that out and express your interest in finding out more about it. Uh, Cthulhu Awakens <laughs> is based on uh, based on kind of the modern age engine um, with a couple of a couple of changes for the game we're doing, a couple of evolutions of the engine, and that's, so on and so forth. That's exciting. Um, you know, during that during the uh, the campaign, we have a ton of stuff planned. Uh, you definitely want to get over there. We'll drop a link here um, on Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday age. I love yep. that. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll have live streams. We'll have interviews. We'll have, I mean, there's just a ton of stuff. Arts, this comment. I mean, it's, it's pretty darn exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but the reason I am here specifically um, is because, um, well, it's because of you, Troy. Because <laughs> you and Nicole... Uh, and some of the other other folks on on your side of the firm um, came up with this idea that I thought was great, which is to sort of help people um, figure out how to do various things in modern age. Because, of course, like one of the challenges with modern age is that there's no modern genre. There are a bunch of modern genres, right? So, you know, that's why we have modes and that's why we have other things. But sometimes... You know, people could appreciate a little bit of direction when they want to run games of a particular type, a particular modern subgenre. So um, we're sort of testing the waters by presenting something called an adventure spark. Um, I love it. And that is something that we are going to uh, release gratis. Um, so uh, it'll just be there for everybody who likes it to enjoy. So the first That's one right. um, is for uh what we call serial capers i like that okay so serial capers are the kind of thing where you know if you've seen you know the a team or leverage or any of those things right where you have a team of people trying to achieve some kind of larcenous plan oriented objective um and also, you know, looking generally at capers, uh, when we're talking about serial capers, we're also talking about the kind of stories that maybe aren't, uh, you know, aren't the grimmest in the world because we expect our heroes to be able to bounce back um, for the next sequel uh, with a numeral representing the number of characters in it um, or the next episode or whatever, right? So, you know. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, noir tales of backstabbing and betrayal, right? Uh, if there's backstabbing and betrayal, it's presented pretty lightly. So uh, I've got it in front of me, and I don't know if uh, if we want to... Yep. Well, you got that there. Um, right, Can I so... mention how much I love the idea of just a little light backstabbing and betrayal? <laughs> yeah, just a smidge. Just yeah. a smidge. You know, hey, Malcolm, what's interesting, and I want to make this, I, I think this is an important thing to note about this, is this came about as a uh, as a result of some conversations uh, with the community, just hanging out and talking with them. And it was actually after, I believe it was after 
um, just a really informative stream where you were kind of sharing thoughts and, and it was this really remarkable kind of convo. We brought it back and sort of talked about it amongst ourselves and we were inspired and, and then the ball just rolled and here it is. I mean, you know, so it's uh, uh, really kind of a nice sort of seeing that full circle of people engaging, people sharing excited feedback, and then this is what you get. Yeah. Well, it's just a little thing, right? So um, basically the way we have set it up is, you know, first of all, of course, we talk about what we're talking about, which is basically a long version of what I just said, right? Uh, you know, it's the caper or heist genre. Um, and we have a few media examples like the ones I mentioned um, in television and film. And we have a, you know, we start with, you know, uh, 20 adventure hooks just to get you started, right? And then from there, we get into exactly who the characters are and what kind of the mainstays of the genre are. And then we get into exactly what parts of modern age you use for it um, and some general advice. So, for example, one of the things that we recommend is that... Um, is that one of the things that is sort of signature to serial capers is that uh, the characters tend to be pretty competent. So, you know, we think, you know, well, maybe it's a good idea to have higher level characters for this sort of thing, right? Um, just so that people can really lean into it. And we recommend uh, level three for that. Okay. Uh, because that lets you do things like hit the master degree in a talent. Um, and, you know, generally in these sorts of things, you're going to have the person who is the best at a particular thing, right? And of course, we also recommend, and this is something people do in their session zeros anyway, uh, that you really coordinate character creation so that everybody has their niche. Right. Yeah, I like it. I like it. And then we talk about, you know, uh, how it works in various modern age modes. Um, you know, of course, it's going to be usually cinematic or pulpy almost never gritty, although sometimes gritty is appropriate. And I'll tell you why. Um, you're going to have variations of these where you really want to lean into the, the kind of skill and planning mini game, right? And you want to do that um, almost at the expense of combat. So in fact, it's not actually that bad necessarily to make things gritty um, because as long as you understand that you don't get to have combat encounters to break up the mood and break up the pacing, right? Or, or switch up the mood anymore because you can't do combat that trivially um, in gritty, mm. right? And so room for gritty and, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's going it. to be investigations and, and, uh, We've also talked about we also talked about how breaching tests, which are called challenge tests in other age games, um, are you know in some ways the bread and butter of this. And actually, earlier when Owen was talking about hazards, uh, he was talking about things that are very often structured, uh, like breaching tests or challenge tests, where you know uh, accumulating obstacles or failure uh, means that you have increasing numbers of complications sort of flying at you. So, so that I love it builds into that, and you know, you know we also talk about uh, which optional rules you might want to use. So one of them, you know, you might want to use conviction because that gives your character from the uh, modern age basic rule book. That's an optional rule that gives your characters a little more oomph. Um, or you know, we have complications and serendipity from the modern age companion, which kind of let you control the rhythm of the story. Uh, and we have, you know, a couple of light optional rules. Um, so, you know, one of those is backup plan stunts, which are things that allow you to kind of tuck stunt points away um, to represent the twist that happens often in these sort of caper things. Because you'll, you know, well, if you look at something like Ocean's Eleven, right, what you have is, you know, the plan and then there are problems with the plan, but the problems with the plan are solved by the fact that the real plan is under the plan you think is the plan. <laughs> right, right. Or what about, <laughs> so what we about have the movie? Mechanism for that. What about the movie Face Off? Like, 
your backup plan is <laughs> you just have someone else's face, right? I mean, it's the yeah, oh, what man. a twist. <laughs> I ah uh, oh John Woo's brief. <laughs> like I, I love John Woo, but that was a weird period. That went. Oh, it was a very like, weird period. Yeah, it went yeah. from like, oh, what was the Van Dam one? Hard Target. Yes, well, Hard Target, which was the most dangerous game, uh, pastiche, one of many, to yes. Wind Talkers. Right. So there's a whole series of movies in between there that are. You're going well, through a thing. He, they knew, well, the thing is, he knew what they wanted him to do, right? They wanted him to do his distinct style, but it all, it's sometimes like it almost kind of became a parody. Like once you started seeing those doves in every movie. Oh, yeah. You knew right? it. Yeah, exactly. Um, kind of like the Wilhelm scream, right? Yeah, like Wilhelm, it just yeah, sort no. of. <laughs> anyway, that doesn't have much to do with the rest of this. But, you know, we also have a couple of other things like, um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that is very common also in these sorts of stories is like, you know, heroes don't get taken over somewhere and just shot in the head, right? Um, right. Or yeah. they don't get taken out by a sniper. So we have, you know, the optional kind of helpless status to represent that where, you know, you're at zero health and, you know, you're not dying you just can't do anything and you're a burden to your buddies they have to drag you along right right because that's the way it is in those stories right i mean so yeah you know owen i uh, owen <laughs> owen and malcolm sorry i um I, I was looking at owen and and uh thinking about malcolm um you know this is such a great well sourced like you you tell people where to go to kind of go deeper and find some of those additional rules to kind of brief you know kind of bring in guidance around that mm -hmm. stuff and uh, there is a really important question and, and folks might have missed this so i want to share it again um our friend philip says um uh is this on sale yet well it won't be for sale because it's free it's free so. that's your surprise everybody you get the link is in chat. Um, we will also tweet it out and put it on Facebook. And um, yeah, this was just such a fun thing to put together, such a great sort of community-driven deal that we want you to take this for a spin and then tell us what you think about it. You know, yeah. share your thoughts and give us some feedback. And uh, it's very evocative. Already, mm -hmm. you know, people are really thinking about the tropes that they kind of want to incorporate in the fun and the, you know, well, the, the doves and all that. Well, like I said, it's not like a full, it's not, it's not a full adventure. It's more like a like white paper on how to make that type of, of adventure in modern. That, yeah. Right, I mean, which, it, it's, it's exactly what we were talking about here, right? Taking here's, here is the process for how you make this kind of thing work in this mm -hmm. game. So it's, it's an explanatory process of how do I do this yeah. kind of game using these rule sets? Yeah, and with and the timeline as vast as modern age, this really gives you a chance to get in there and have some fun and yeah. flex. And a bit. Uh, I know that the I know that the helpless status in there um, is actually inspired by some of the stuff that's in the new fantasy age core. Uh, oh, right, because there have been sort of like uh, some tweaks to what what happens when you get beaten up real bad um to support a kind of broader set of of play styles there too so um, well but that's always the fun thing with age is is the synergy between the different lines oh man i used that word you did <laughs> nicely done i think well i mean for example i think you could very easily uh if you happened to own the expanse rpg which is a great rpg uh which has fortune instead of traditional health but it also has the churn which uh, as you burn through your fortune, the churn gets more and more complicated because as things go bad, they can go really bad. And I think it would be very easy for someone who had that rule set to adapt the churn rules for specifically the sort of serial caper storytelling. Yes. And those are actually, the funny thing with the churn is that it is in the modern age companion in the form of complications. Right. And that is because when the churn was being designed <laughs> before the expanse came out, I lifted it for modern age and I made some changes for it because I thought, oh, you know, it's a in the expanse, it's anchored to a specific genre. So they don't, well, you know, so this that is so a lot of the a lot of the fallout rights itself, I have to be more specific. So I did that. 
And then Steve was like, well, we think we need to make the churn more specific. And I was like, oh, well, look, here you go. <laughs> I had just stolen it from you earlier. So, <laughs> so the current never, churn. Never, never stolen. It's, it's all, it's all yeah. uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. So the current churn is kind of like, you know, has some input from complications, which has some input from the previous churn. And Jonesy yeah. mentions, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. churn also ends up in and Blue Rose. Of course, you know, Fortune uh, may have found its way into Cthulhu Awakens, maybe, yep. as an option. Mm. So, you know. Well, listen, gentlemen, uh, I got to tell you both, always a delight. And uh, Malcolm, this is great stuff. And I know you are eternally Canadian about all this, but really great work. And you should be taking a victory lap and people should be very quite excited about uh, about just sort of thinking about other ways to get in uh, and get engaged with uh, with Modern Age. I think it's a I think it is a work of art and I'm not even being hyperbolic. Um, You're being a little hyperbolic. Um, you know, that's my nature, sir. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, the um, the good news is that, yeah, we've got so much stuff going on. We're going to provide this link to everybody. You're going to be watching. You're going to be, wait, what, what? I don't have a chat. I don't know what to do. Well, you'll um, see a, a, a uh, in the show description. Uh, in addition to that, um, you will, uh, you know, to get this information and to be one of the first that know, you're going to want to subscribe. You're going to want to click on a thumb or if it's a star, give them all to us, you know, whatever it is that you have to offer um, through your particular social media venue of choice. We want that. And uh, in exchange, we shall give you fun program and free stuff. And, uh, and we shall all rejoice. Now, if you've got thoughts about this and you want to share some ideas or you want to, as you dig through it, you've got some questions, send a note to let's play at greenronin.com and we will endeavor to, uh, uh, bring Malcolm on to uh, a Thursday to dive into those questions and elaborate, um, uh, send your accolades and your thanks and uh, all of that uh, uh, to Let's Play at GreenRonin.com uh, as well. And I'm happy to share them. I will read them aloud on a Thursday, and, perhaps. And all especially uh, if you if you get this and you should, it's free and you like it, which you should. It's brilliant. And you want more, which you should because it's useful. Uh, I strongly suspect you should, you know, tell Green Ronin probably at let's play at .com, that this was good and you would like more. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I will yeah. definitely stay, sit around and do not do do no more of these unless I am told to do more of these. So if you <laughs> want more, you should tell me or tell someone that you want more. It'll somehow make its way back to me, probably through the graces of Troy. It would be my pleasure to share. And so make sure you share that information. Also, um, uh, stay tuned for our big, you know, Cthulhu Palooza. It's going to be something. Um, a lot of great stuff going on there. We'll share those links as well in our show notes. And don't forget about Monday. We have Mutants and Masterminds Monday with Crystal Frazier, Steve Kinson, myself. Oh, and Alex Thomas as well. The Alex Thomas, uh, who wrote up a really great um, uh uh, Ronin Roundtable. So you want to check that out at greenronin.com. And then finally, um, you know, we're sending you over to freeronin.com to dig around and grab that, um, the adventure spark when a plan comes together. And you might want to just spend some time poking around at freeronin.com. It is a, I, it's, it, it's shocking to me how much free stuff is over there. Good stuff even. Um, so find yourself something nice and, uh, you know, um, uh, let us know what you think, and uh, we will call it a day for today. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Everybody who's watching, thank you as well. Um, and we will see you next Thursday for Thursday. See you then. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye, folks.